We complete video games for the same reason that we step off at the top of an escalator. The journey propels us towards our destination. The function of taking us from point A to point B is inherent to its design. Good escalators stop you from getting off halfway through the ride, and in that same way, good video games stop you from quitting halfway through the story. You need to reach the ending. Typically, endings are meant to round off a story. They conclude the adventure the player's been on, lower the stakes back to zero, and force the characters to face the consequences of their actions. The player is able to walk away from the experience satisfied with how things panned out, good or bad. A good ending needs to do one thing in particular. It needs to get to the point. The point of ending your story isn't simply to stop the plot from continuing to happen, it's to provide a natural conclusion to the story thus far, answering the major plot questions, finishing character arcs, and driving home the main point of the narrative, which is derived from its core themes. We already know where Deltarune is going. The adventure thus far has been foretold by the prophecy, with the ending of the game most likely coinciding with the world ending roaring. The good news is that the three heroes of legend will banish the angel's heaven, balancing out light and dark, and saving the world. This is what Ralse says will happen in the story. This is what the prophecy says will happen in the story. This is seemingly what Gaster says will happen in the story. All the way back in 2016, even. Deltarune's story is... simple. This suggestion made no sense to me back in 2018, and it makes less sense to me now, even though Toby Fox himself corroborated it. Undertale's story wasn't exactly overcomplicated, but it also couldn't be explained without diving into multiple layers of meaning. It took several complex ideas and explored them by reacting to our level of engagement with an RPG world, telling both a meaningful in-universe narrative and a biting real-world meta-narrative that viciously condemns your choice of playstyle. It has things to say about the nature of games, about the feelings we have towards fictional characters, and about the desire to consume every drip of content, even if it ultimately kills our connection with the game world. It wasn't simple, which is why Deltarune's simplicity was so off-putting to me. After beating Chapter 1 in 2018, I stopped thinking about Deltarune. I had come to the conclusion that Chris and Susie were probably just playing pretend in the closet, and that the game is a big allegory for growing up and letting go of the fantasy world you loved as a child. I was one of the biggest Undertale fans there could be, but there was something about Deltarune's story that felt... artificial. The bog-standard RPG prophecy, the sudden lack of meaningful choices, it felt as if the point of the game was to be found in its simplicity. By breaking the conventions of Undertale and grounding its cast in reality, it was telling its audience that this isn't a game about saving a fantasy world. It was a story about finding the point of your existence in the real world. And then 2021 happened. All of these characters were real, they were simply one layer below the light world as determined by this game's super deep world building. Magic? Hell yeah, it's real! The adventures we had? Absolutely happened. Chris? Possessed by an outside entity that may or may not be the person behind the screen. Gaster? Buddy, Gaster is everywhere. If you die in the dark world, you'll die in real life. What is darker than dark? What the hell is the weird route? Someone's stuck in the cold, we should probably figure out what's going on there. Entire story. So began my descent into the river of rot. Brain rot, that is. Deltarune brain rot. And I came with a mission. I sailed into the heart of darkness to search for one answer. What is Deltarune? And what exactly is the story supposed to be doing? And then I discovered something. Something that shook me to my very core. Deltarune and its inhabitants are doomed. And it will take a miracle to save them. It's probably best that we start with the obvious question. What is Deltarune doing at a surface level? This is where the game has been clearest with its intentions. Deltarune is about a small, depressing town. Despite the town consisting of fun characters with quirky personalities, nearly everyone is dissatisfied with life. On the lesser end of the spectrum, characters like Undyne and Caddy are bored or frustrated with their overbearing family. Father Alvin is conflicted regarding his late father's legacy. Birdly struggles with expectations placed on him by the adults in his life. On the more drastic side, you have Asgore, who's divorced and living out of the dirty back room of his flower business which is dangerously close to being shut down due to a complete lack of sales. Susie's home life is either horrible or non-existent, as she's, well, literally starving. Rudolph Holiday is on his deathbed, and his health does not look to be improving at all. 
Chief among all of these characters is Chris, but I'll get to them later. Melancholy is the perfect, well, no, the only word capable of describing the emotional backdrop of hometown. The only good things these characters have are memories. One thing I like about the Light World is that it treats its characters seriously. Contrary to Undertale, the Light World does not have magic. There's not a king, nor is there a royal guard, there's a police station. Characters are forced to deal with their problems not through using RPG mechanics like soul transfer or magic do all liquids. These characters are treated like real people and forced to deal with their problems as if they were part of our world. This isn't the kind of world you think of when I say fantasy RPG. But I bet this is. The Dark Worlds are the natural counterbalance to the doom and gloom of the Light World. Created through the powers of determination, the Dark Worlds turn realistic surroundings into massive fantastic kingdoms, inhabited by whatever junk you've got lying around. This is where all the adventuring takes place. We meet Ralse, the totally wholesome, fluffy friend to all, defined by his desire to please. We interact with a cast of kooky supporting characters. We face off against dangerous but cartoonish villains. King aims to create a world ruled by Darkeners, as the Lightener's abandonment of his people turned his heart black with hatred. Queen aims to create a new knight she can use to also blanket the world in darkness, with the exception that she wants to create a paradise for Lighteners to live in, one that caters to their every desire. Both villains are ultimately trounced by the powers of friendship and self-discovery. On two separate occasions, our heroes save the world. And Susie absolutely eats it up. After all, aren't these worlds better? As explained by Susie and Noelle, this is a world where you can do whatever you want without someone telling you no. A world where everything can be healed with a little spell. This isn't the light world. Magic and monsters and fantasy and excitement are all the ingredients that make up this deeper plane of reality. Ralsei's ever-expanding castle town promises to be a place you can go no matter what's happening outside. So, why bother ever leaving? Every character's deepest personal conflict can be completely ignored here. This is the perfect world! Well, not so fast, Buster. The Dark World, despite the fun times shared by all, are not perfect. Susie never feels full from the food she eats, even saying that it's like nothing she eats here matters. The Dark Worlds aren't real, they're like fantasy dream worlds. In game, the Dark Worlds are often compared to dreams. So, quite obviously, the Dark Worlds aren't better. They're fake, and the hero's understanding of them is going to change as we progress through the story, ultimately determining that despite the conflict, we can't leave the real world behind. This is evidenced by Susie's current understanding of Darkners. In this scene, during the beginning of Chapter 2, Susie asks where everyone went. Ralse whispers to Chris that they should gather all the items from adjacent classrooms and bring them back to town. These items are the physical items that bring the Darkners to life. So when you bring them to Castletown, everyone returns. Susie specifically says she doesn't know how we brought them back, but she doesn't care. After leaving the closet, Lancer, who promised to follow us to the library, is in our pockets, because remember, he's a playing card. However, Susie is confused and assumes that Lancer must have ditched us. The game is pointing out that Susie, who thinks of these worlds as better than the real one, hasn't figured out that they're made from objects given life. She doesn't know that they're fake. So, if that's the case, as opposed to never leaving the Dark World, why do we ever have to leave the Light World? If these worlds are fake on a metafictional level, then why bother even engaging with them in the first place? Well, because if we don't, the world is going to end. The story of Deltarune has been foretold by a prophecy, acting as the primary engine driving our characters forward on their adventure. For millennia, light and dark have been in balance. But if this harmony were to shatter, a terrible calamity we come to find out is called the Roaring will occur. Darkness will encompass the world, the Darkeners will turn to statues, the Titans will emerge from the Earth, and the Lighteners will be left to fend for themselves. The Earth will draw her final breath. However, only then, three heroes will appear at World's Edge to banish the Angel's Heaven. Balance will be restored and the world saved from darkness. This is the legend told to us by Ralse, and it's the reason that we have to seek out the Dark Fountains in the first place. An anonymous vigilante known only as the Roaring Knight has been going around and opening up these dark worlds for unknown reasons. Our goal is to seal these worlds and, by extension, stop the Knight. The prophecy is a mystery of its own. Where it came from, where it's leading to, and why it seems to be coming true despite our heroes barely trying to fulfill it is all worth wondering about. For now though, what's worth keeping in mind is that our characters aren't actively questioning the prophecy. Susie hasn't really worried too much about the fate of the light world or the night, and Chris hasn't said a word either. Rase is keen on following it to a T. 
Our main characters haven't really treated their adventures like a quest to stop the end of the world. As a matter of fact, our adventures are seen as an escape by the characters themselves, without concern for the larger implications. That's not to say Susie is careless, just that, to her, these worlds are a fantasy escape, and worth being treated the same way we'd treat saving the world in a video game. That's what the adventure is all about. That's what Deltarune is all about. And despite the Dark Worlds being quote-unquote fake, they still serve as an escape for our protagonists. An escape from the harsh realities of divorce, death, abandonment, and whatever else they may be feeling. Despite the plot requiring us to engage with both worlds, emotionally, the question still remains. Why bother even adventuring in these fake worlds? And the answer is because the Dark Worlds are a positive influence on us. Each character confronts the problems within their lives and learns to be a better person. Maybe it's tearing down your superiority complex, or maybe it's finding it in your heart to stand up for yourself. And beyond that, the most important thing the Dark Worlds has done is build bonds. Chris, Susie, Noelle, and Birdly were not friends prior to Deltarune, or at least not active friends. And yet, through these adventures, through allowing themselves to be unbound by societal conventions and real-world struggles, they've been able to open up and find connections amongst themselves. At the end of the day, despite the darkness that's encroaching on their lives, the dark fountains serve as pillars of light, offering a way through the fog by finding your way out together. The dreamer's divorce, the mayor's cutthroat attitude, hell, even Rudy's death don't seem impossible to overcome when you're able to rely on the people closest to you. This is simple. This is Deltarune's simple story. By all means, I think this is going to be the bulk of the game. Regardless of what we're about to discuss, I think this is the general point of Deltarune. Conflict in the real world, forcing people to escape into fantasy only to build bonds and become stronger, enabling them to take down the darkness they face in their lives. It's certainly the idea that most casual players are left with upon completing the game. However, there's one thing we haven't spoken about, and it's our main character, Chris. Chris is noticeably unimportant in the grand scheme of the story I've just described. Chris is an outlier. At the end of both chapters, Chris does something crazy. They rip their soul out of their body and begin acting on their own. In chapter 1, they brandish a knife and look at the screen, and in chapter 2, they open the door, turn on the TV, and open a dark world. I personally read this scene as confirmation that Chris is the knight. Others don't, and there's good arguments on either side. Regardless of your interpretation, what's really, really weird about this, and what takes the entire game's premise and flips it upside down, and what makes Chris different than any other video game character is that Chris is doing bad things. Bad things that we, as the player, are actively working against. We've just learned about the dangers of opening a dark fountain. We're working towards sealing them alongside our new friends. And yet, for some odd reason, despite Birdly being shouted at and warned against opening even a single new fountain, Chris is doing it. There's nothing wrong with characters who do bad things. Typically, they learn they're doing something wrong and change their ways. But I can't think of a video game where the main character periodically works against the player's goal. You would be correct in assuming that this scene is a complete character assassination. This doesn't seem like something that Chris would do based on the adventure we've had thus far. And you'd be correct. Upon Chapter 1's release, many figured that Chris must be possessed. The only way to explain the sudden change in attitude is that some Kara-esque figure, or maybe even Kara themselves, must be possessing them. Some other entity controlling our character, the person we play as. To new players, it's easy to assume that Chris is a standard self-insert character. Chris says nothing, takes the basic role of knight and party leader, and is able to make whatever choices you want. There's nothing indicating that you aren't playing as Chris until this moment. Because of that, many believe that Chris's possession was caused by an outside force who was taking over our body. But this mindset was completely backwards. Chris is indeed possessed, but not by Kara. They're possessed by us, by the player. We are the red soul that they rip out of their body, and our influence forced them through the adventure thus far. We know this because we can move around in the cage using the arrow buttons, and in Chapter 2, it's outright stated that Chris has strings they want to break free from. Our name is plainly stated in-game, and our presence is recognized by multiple characters. This cutscene introduces the separation of two identities within the same physical form, us and Chris. And herein lies Deltarune's real central conflict. Chris is what happens when someone becomes a self-insert character. They had a life before we existed, they had friends, a history, and beliefs. Then one day we showed up and started making choices for them. We controlled them, we moved them to wherever we want to go, and forced them to do things they weren't comfortable with. 
Most notably, we're slowly destroying elements of their character that make them who they are, including their ability to play piano. After fighting Spamped and Neo, you can choose to tell Susie you either are or aren't mentally okay after the encounter. The answer you pick depends on how you personally feel, and yet, based on Chris's reactions, there's definitely a right answer as to what they believe. Chris's central conflict within the plot is that they are a self-insert protagonist who doesn't want to be the self-insert protagonist. Yes, they enjoy their time spent with Susie, and it's implied that they do enjoy the Dark Worlds, but our control over them is not something they like at all. So what's the point of this, then? How does this fit into the larger story? Seeing that progressing the Possession storyline is the cliffhanger both chapters end on, Toby's basically framing this part of the narrative as more relevant than saving the world from king or queen. That's not to say these things aren't important, just that Deltarune as a story is putting more weight on the Chris storyline, as I believe it's at the heart of the whole story. But why is that? What does this sole Possession player character separation story have to do with everything else I've been discussing? Well, truthfully... We don't know yet. Chapter 2 didn't really address the elephant in the room, it just heavily implied there might be one. While we now know for certain that us and Chris are different entities with different lives, we don't really know where the game is going with it. We're left with big questions. Who are we if not Chris? What is Chris's story really about? And why are we inhabiting their body? So at this point, the best we can do is to start guessing. It's here I'd like to take a brief pause, though, because our journey up the river appears to have taken a dark turn. It appears as if this river has cut into the forest of stupid bullshit. The term meta-narrative is thrown around a lot by Deltarune fans. <laughs> While there are different ways to use the term, the definition I'm sticking with is one that pops up when you search for it on Google. A meta-narrative is a narrative account that experiments with or explores the idea of storytelling, often by drawing attention to its own artificiality. This is old news to Undertale fans. Undertale told a regular story, but then reincorporated that story as part of its meta-narrative, which, to make a very long story short, told a story about the players. Deltarune is inevitably going to end up doing the same thing. I've just spoken about how Deltarune has separated the identities of its player and its main character. In this way, it's acknowledging its own artificiality and the fact that we're literally playing it. It's a video game, and it knows it. Forget how lore-wise the player is a part of the story. That's not actually as important as you'd think. The true relevant question is, why is the player's existence acknowledged? Before I dive into why specifically, the general answer is obvious. Because, like Undertale, Deltarune wants to tell a story about the player. However, unlike Undertale, Deltarune seems to be incorporating the player, the human player, into the actual plot of the story. The player is as much an active participant as Chris, Susie, or Valse. Deltarune's main narrative is the meta-narrative. This opens up several cans of worms. The point of branching off into this segment is because I want to take a brief moment to discuss suspension of disbelief. It's worth immediately acknowledging that this isn't really us. Deltarune is a game written by Toby Fox, and just because we're a part of it doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge our existence within it as entirely fake. Undertale was careful not to explicitly include us in the adventure as an active participant. The story criticized Frisk for using their powers to reset the loop, rather than us for resetting the game. But the point still came across. The meta-narrative is thinly veiled critique on the player and how they play a game, but it does all the work in the game itself. Deltarune seemingly can't do this anymore, right? After all, our name and a vessel that we explicitly control have both shown up in the game, meaning that we need to be acknowledged as ourselves. And, well, not necessarily. I think Deltarune's doing something slightly different. Basically, Undertale with extra steps. Rather than completely separating the real-world implications and in-universe narrative, Deltarune has a middleman to help connect the two. The long story short is this. There's something I'm obviously waiting to talk about. Deltarune's true second layer. That layer acknowledges our existence and the light and dark worlds in a way that narratively makes sense. The light and dark worlds don't have to acknowledge what we are, just the fact that we exist. And Deltarune has already laid the groundwork for this to happen, with that second layer providing a natural bridge between us. Deltarune hasn't opened its mouth and said the word player once. Well, technically it's said it twice, but entirely unrelated to the context of an outside force controlling the world. The player isn't controlling Chris in the context of the story. Something else is. The name Deltarune will use to refer to us is the Angel. The Angel is referred to plenty of times throughout Deltarune. Clover says an angel is watching before its other head asks, you believe that garbage? This line works best if we infer that the angel they're talking about is indeed currently watching. 
Spamton talks about wanting to pierce heaven, where he can find true freedom and lose the strings that control him, while also implying those strings are attached to the fun gang as well. The Delta Rune itself has an angel watching over the three heroes, something we're literally doing. Father Alvin says, let the angel's power light your way. That's interesting. I sure do wonder if the game ever references power lighting someone's way. In the King fight, we're told that our soul shined its power onto Susie and Ralsei. The song that plays when you seal a fountain, your power. And that power isn't Chris's. It's heavily implied that the person who can utilize these save points, aka the light only you can see, and seal the fountains is us, the player. Every save point, rather than mentioning determination as they did in Undertale, a substance which, by the way, ends up being crucial to the plot, instead reads, the power of blank shines within you. The power of fluffy boys shines within you. The power of adventure shines within you. You are filled with the power of a new adventure, and so on. The angel doll Noel and Des made? Well, it's got a distinct lack of facial features, heavily reminiscent of the player character we were originally intended for. The only through line with the angel is its ability to shine a path forward through its power which is typically interpreted as determine the future. And wouldn't you know it, Ralsei tells us that the soul holds will, compassion, and the fate of the world, despite the Light World book on humans not mentioning anything about fate whatsoever. All of this boils down to one central truth. The player is the angel. Like I said before, the main story of Deltarune that takes place in the light and dark worlds don't have to acknowledge how exactly we're interacting with the world. It just has to acknowledge our existence. To that world, we're an eldritch being with the power of ultimate control. We literally fulfill the exact role of an all-powerful being their religion is based on. In that way, these two terms are parallel. Deltarune will continue to call us the Angel, though the actual story is about the player. Should Chris ever look at the screen and say there's a player playing me? Suspension of disbelief would be totally destroyed. Think of it in the way that games like Earthbound did it, treating us like a wholly outside force that gives the game its light. After all, isn't that what we are? Forget about deep lore nonsense for a minute. We literally have total control and right fate through our choices. We shine the path forward and are an outside entity looking down on everyone. Don't think of this as me saying we really are this being they worship. The actual identity of this thing is not the point. The real point is the role we play. Kara and Azriel were both the angel in Undertale depending on what route you play, despite the fact that neither of them were the literal angel in the prophecy. In that same way, we're the angel in Deltarune. And as the angel, we have the power to determine the future, which allows us to get back to what the point of controlling Chris is in the first place. Deltarune's previously described parallel stories are working on two layers here. On the one layer, you have Chris, who's being controlled by and slowly rebelling against a being known as the Angel. On the other side of things, what this is all supposed to be, is a player who's controlling a player character. Again, I don't think that they're going to acknowledge that they're in a video game world. I don't think this dividing wall will ever break down fully. Yes, we'll understand our experience within Deltarune's story as that of a player who was thrust from their character. However, in-universe, this is an eldritch entity having its control over Chris removed. Giving the player a name decided by those who believe in an all-powerful fate-deciding orb, a name that invokes mythical or religious imagery rather than technological imagery, allows the story to still work in-universe. It's not that I don't think Toby can pull off a story where everybody realizes they're in a video game, I just think there are enough pieces in place to hint that he's trying to work around that. Wrapping our existence, the player's existence, within the story in a nice, neat label and role that characters can understand without having their non-existent minds broken allows that wall to stay up. All that being said, we don't have to worry about the fact that we are the player. Yet. Right now, we just need to understand the role we play in the story, which is that of the angel. Chris sees us as something that controls them. So then, with this all established, what's up with Chris? What are their beliefs, desires, and memories that shape them as a character? And why should it matter that we're controlling them specifically? One of the core traits of a player insert character is that they have as little backstory as possible, with no character-specific goals they strive for, beyond something vague the player can agree with. Chrono Trigger is one of my favorite games ever, but Chrono is just an extension of the player. His only character traits is that he's faithful to his allies, bold, brave, etc. There are so many silent protagonists I can point to, which basically act as vessels for the player's mind. And yet, Chris is not that. Chris has a backstory, feelings, beliefs, desires that, as we currently assume, go against our beliefs. So why is Chris important? Chris is a complex character. At the core of their existence is a dissatisfaction with who they are. 
an ever-present longing to be someone else. Since they were presumably adopted by the Dreamers, they felt like an outcast. They asked their parents when their horns were going to grow in because they wanted to be a monster, and they got plastic horns that they wore all the time. But Chris didn't have a bad childhood. As a matter of fact, despite their introverted nature, it sounded like they had a lot of friends. The person they clearly liked the most, though, was Asriel, who they look up to greatly. Asriel is, well, perfect. He's got all the trophies, he's the one with the perfect singing voice, he's the one with the big dreams in life. And yet he still made time for Chris. When they played games together, Asriel would make sure Chris used the real controller, while Asriel used the knockoff. The Dreamers were the picture-perfect family. Asgore was the chief of police and was well-respected in town. They would go to the diner for family dinner, like a real family does. The Dreamers were close with the holidays. Chris, Asriel, Noel, and December were very close and would frequently hang out. Chris was known to play the piano and apparently was pretty good at it. They had a good life. And then tragedy struck. It is unknown exactly how everything played out like it did, but somehow these two families and Chris's entire life fell apart. December holiday disappeared. Asgore was kicked off the force. He and Toriel later split. And yet, despite this, Asriel and Chris would still go to the diner on Sundays, drinking hot chocolate. But not even that could last forever, as Asriel went off to college. During the events of Deltarune, Chris's room is barren. There's nothing here. They're lethargic. They're described as typically quiet and introverted. They have become distant. The taste of hot chocolate and the memories of Asriel make their throat tighten. And worst of all, they can't play piano anymore. The most telling moment when it comes to who Chris is can be found at the library. Examining this sign reads, The Teen Zone, where teens can be kids. A feeling of immense relief washes over you. Immense relief at the thought of regressing to a time that came before, mixed with the knowledge of what Chris's life used to be like compared to how it is now, should tell you everything about Chris's desires as a character. Chris is at the nexus of everything that's happened to hometown. The emotionally desolate town is representative of Chris's world being torn apart. It makes perfect sense that we're controlling Chris of all people. The world they knew disappeared. Life is forcing them forward. It's easy to get caught up in the specifics of how we're controlling Chris and what cool deep lore is influencing their thoughts on us. I think, though, that it doesn't actually need to be that deep. Our control over Chris comes naturally with the life they've lived. With everything ripped away from them, they feel like life is forcing them to march forward on a path they do not like. They feel like they can't choose who they are in this world. Toriel has spoken to them about how soon they'll be going off to university as well. They're struggling with growing up and letting their memories go. At the same time, they're also struggling with the role the world has forced them into. Nobody really knows who they are. The soul and the player projecting themselves onto Chris and forcing them to do things they want is symbolic of their struggle with life itself. The inability to play piano is most likely caused by our possession over them, but the point has something to do with how Chris, forced into a role they don't want, is losing all the aspects that make them themselves. That's the point of the soul. It goes beyond what if a video game character realized they were possessed by a player. It's doing that with a character who, emotionally, is at a point of their life where they feel like they're being thrust forward on a path they don't want to take, warped into somebody they don't want to be, forced to perform a role they don't like. A struggle they've always felt, exacerbated by the expectations of this new world they've begun to explore. We're basically an allegory for growing up. But what about that deep lore? Here's the thing about Chris. We still haven't covered why they opened a dark fountain. This is where we need to start speculating a little bit. Chris has a little bit more backstory that I haven't spoken about. See, there's this mysterious bunker on the edge of town, and apparently Chris has seen inside of it. Whatever it is they saw was frightening, so much so that Snowy and Monster Kid pretend to not be scared when talking about it, asking if they believe what Chris said. Susie gets the sense that Chris is clearly bothered by whatever happened there, so she says they don't have to talk about it. Chris is associated with apples. A lot. They have apple-scented shampoo. Apple is one of the words from the word puzzles in Chapter 2. The Chris tea tastes like apple juice. Susie comments on Chris's hair smelling like apples. Apple shampoo is brought up again when Chris asks if Susie drinks it. Noelle's blog post, The Newest Girl Girl, is entirely about Chris and apples. Susie talks about Chris smelling like apples again and using apple shampoo again and throws an apple at Chris that they catch and bite. What is up with this? Well, we can't go too wild with the speculation, but it is worth noting that, biblically, 
apples are associated with the forbidden fruit from the story of creation. In the Bible, the forbidden fruit is an apple found in the Garden of Eden, which Adam and Eve were commanded by God to restrain from eating. It was his one rule. However, they were tempted by a serpent who promised for their eyes to be opened, and ate the fruit, gaining the knowledge that God didn't want them to have. It's not enough to automatically assume that this means anything. Chris's affinity for apples being used as a symbol of taking the forbidden fruit and gaining extraordinary knowledge, while cool, requires examples of extraordinary knowledge before it can actually be confirmed. And we don't have any of the- uh, oh, wait a minute. I think we actually do. Chris knows a little bit about the future. At the very least, they knew about how Chapter 2 will end, as they planned to open the Chapter 3 Dark World. In between Chapters 1 and 2, they plug the TV in, a television which has not been plugged in for a very, very long time. Chapter 2 repeatedly makes references to the fact that Chris will eventually wash their hands. Rudy asks if Chris is practicing for tonight's hand-washing marathon, with the dialogue specifically focusing on the fact that they're getting ready to wash their hands at a later time. In the beginning of Chapter 2, the sink says it is not yet time to wash your hands. The fact that this dialogue in the morning implies that Chris is planning to wash their hands at night starts a logical domino effect. The reason Chris slash Toriel's tires is to keep Susie at their house overnight. That's the only thing they do while washing their hands. The planning of the hand washing is clearly implied to be a planning of this event, but for them to have known they'll slash Toriel's tires to keep Susie over, they would have to have known that Susie will even be over, which was totally an accidental last minute thing. Not only that, but the opening of the Dark World, which seems to be the reason that Chris keeps Susie overnight in the first place, only works if the TV is plugged in, which it was the night before. Chris planned this entire event. They needed to know how Dark Worlds worked prior to Chapter 2, meaning they have some extraordinary knowledge. Not enough? Okay, fine, fine. Well, in the intro of the game, which I'm not ready to fully go into yet, Chris's name yields a response, indicating that they'll be as important as Susie or Noelle. And yet, we weren't meant to play as them. What kind of role would they have had? Considering everyone... Considering everyone didn't think they were coming to school that day, and the party was seemingly always intended to be us, Susie, and Ralsei, perhaps they had a different role in the story. There's a lot of other bits about Chris that point us in this specific direction. Chris is a fan of the occult and magic. They studied the occult, to what extent we really don't know, with Caddy. They searched the internet for tutorials on how to do magic. Magic is not real in the Deltarune world. This isn't a whole, you know, human versus monster thing. This is purely a Chris thing. In Chapter 2, when fighting Pop-Up, each character accidentally clicks on ads they just so happen to be interested in. Susie clicks on ads relating to food, Noelle misclicks on female Santas in your area, and creepy game glitch compilations. All of them reveal deeper parts of the characters. Chris clicks on demon summoning classes for teens. Chris's general strangeness does not end with us. There's something else that's been going on. The game implies that the cage Chris throws their soul into has had a fair amount of usage in the past, almost as if Chris has previously removed their soul? But why? This seems to make no sense. Toriel actually asks Alphys if Chris is okay, as she's been a little concerned lately. It seems as if perhaps Chris's weirdness started before we even came into the picture. Looking at all of this, things are starting to line up. Chris has negative feelings towards their relationship with Asriel that seem to go beyond simply missing him. They refuse to look in his room at Queen's Mansion because there's nothing they'll learn. When drinking the hot chocolate, which was once a source of nostalgia and joy, their throat tightens. Finally, when taking money from Asriel's drawer, Chris reluctantly borrows five dollars. It's not theirs after all. But trying to take more gives us the response of, You have already taken enough. It seems as if something may have happened to divide Chris and Asriel, though we don't have abject proof yet. This isn't a guarantee, but I do definitely read these pieces of dialogue as indicating some sort of tension between them, or perhaps, if there isn't tension between them, some sort of guilt on Chris's part for taking something from Asriel. In terms of the larger Deltarune backstory, it's clear there is a huge chunk missing. While the game hasn't painted a broad picture of the relationship between Chris, Asriel, Des, and Noelle, there seems to be a specific event or chain of events that caused these characters' lives to break apart. While there's no way to figure out exactly what it is just yet, I think I've got a pretty good guess, and keep in mind this is just a guess. You can take everything else I've said about Chris, about them facing off against fate which has ruthlessly decided they need to grow up and leave their cozy childhood behind, and about them being at the center of the breaking down of both families in some unknown way, about them generally having a larger role in the story than we know about, and leave it at that. That's it. You don't have to follow this exact train of thought. However, allow me to tell you what I think happened. 
Chris caused something bad to happen. They didn't kill Asriel because it does, doesn't seem likely, however they did take something from him. It seems likely that Chris accidentally caused or failed to stop whatever happened to December Holiday. Asriel and Noel either don't know or feel equally responsible, considering that Noel never speaks about it, and Asriel continued going to the diner with Chris after Toriel and Asgore split. At some unknown point in time, Chris discovered what's in the bunker, something or someone that is equivalent to a demon of sorts, or at the very least has ties in demonic symbolism. Chris gained extraordinary knowledge, not from biting into a fruit, but from conversing with this individual. Specifically, Chris was assigned a role of their own in this story, as evidenced by the intro of the game, and they learned about how to open a dark world. That was until we were suddenly thrust inside of them, something even they weren't expecting. Thus began Deltarune. Now I know how hard it is to believe a big lore dump theory like that. Deltarune's not a mystery meant to be poured over and solved like FNAF, it's purposefully withholding information until future chapters, specifically as to not give away all of the surprises. You know, like a story does. This specific explanation as to how Chris got involved in the story in the first place may not be entirely accurate. Maybe Des's disappearance had nothing to do with them, but they still contacted a demonic entity in response to try and bring her back. Maybe, alternatively, Des's disappearance happened in the bunker, and was caused by the previously mentioned entity. Maybe Asgore being fired from the Force had nothing to do with Chris, and the sudden destruction of their life was entirely out of their hands. After all, that would kind of fit with the themes of Chris's story, right? With Deltarune being their attempt to take the future into their hands. Well, I will say one thing. I do think Chris is at the center of the story, and probably either caused or was a direct witness to whatever happened back then with Des. I imagine that's also what got Asgore fired from the Force, what led to the divorce, the split between the Dreamers and Holidays, etc. But I understand that still doesn't excuse this shaky foundation that'll be used to support the rest of this video. Chris caused Des's disappearance? Okay, it definitely puts them at the center of the story and explains their general attitude. Chris feels guilty towards Asriel? Okay, makes sense, they probably killed or caused his best friend to disappear. Chris has extraordinary knowledge and spoke to a demon that gave them said extraordinary knowledge? What? How does that even play into the story at large? Please let me go on one tangent. Just one, please. I promise I won't bring this up again, but it would not be a spooky dude video if I don't talk about- I 100% believe Chris is the knight. I'm not even hiding it anymore. That is what I genuinely think is going on. And thinking this while, yes, admittedly being a little odd evidence-wise, fixes all of the narrative problems with, yes, my admittedly made-up interpretation of what's happening in the story. But that's beyond the point. Let me explain. Chris caused Des's disappearance. Chris felt guilty and it possibly warped their perspective of reality. That one event had a domino effect that tore apart Chris's entire life. One day, Chris contacts whatever was in the bunker, whatever could tell them a little about the future, about extraordinary knowledge, or mostly, about creating a dark world. See, whatever Chris's quote-unquote original role in the story was, it involved opening the Chapter 3 Dark World, which, as I previously said, was planned long in advance, based on the domino effect of logic. One of my biggest problems with night theories is that they make no sense. The night is affected by a personal tragedy that causes them to fall into escapism and almost end the world. Doesn't make sense for 99% of Deltarune's characters. Except for one. See, for every reason the mayor might want to be the knight, for every reason Asgore would want to be the knight, for every reason Asriel would want to be the knight, every single one of them applies to Chris. They are literally at the center of every tragedy that happened in hometown. The flavor text when checking things implies they want to go back to this time, the time when they were a kid playing with Asriel. Chris's story is about wanting to fight the path life has put them on, about escaping from the cold, harsh, unchanging reality by slipping away from it into fantasy. When they fight us, when they fight the path they're on, they're fighting growing up, moving forward, and so for them to be given instructions on where to open dark worlds, in specific locations we just so happen to enter, perhaps with the promise of finally being free from reality, makes total sense. Except, now Chris is realizing that the way they felt about life has become a reality. A physical representation of how life is dragging them forward has come into existence, completely by accident. By making a deal with the devil, Chris allowed themselves to be put on a set path that they cannot deviate from, no matter how hard they try. Although, our intrusion might not actually be accidental.
Something pushed us into Chris. Something deviated from the intended plan. Something wants us to know that you can't choose who you are in this world. And perhaps that something is the only thing that can help unravel all of the tangled knots within this story and save Chris from falling into ruin. So that's Deltarune. That's it. You don't have to believe Chris is the knight, by the way. You could believe the other theory, just that they have extraordinary knowledge without necessarily being the knight. Truthfully speaking, it is a pretty simple story. On the one hand, we have a town full of kids who have to learn to carve their own roles in life and who confront their darkest insecurities through fantasy adventures. And you have, at the center of it all, Chris, a character whose life is practically running on autopilot. To them, the light is running low. The shadows have started to grow. And the places that they know, as well as their memories, feel like fantasy. Now, suddenly, after finding some form of cursed knowledge, the angel has been thrust inside them and is forcing them to follow some kind of prophecy. Will Chris and us be able to make amends and come back together to stop the roaring? Will Chris be able to come to terms with whatever's happened back then? Considering Asriel is coming to town late in the week, it seems like that's where all of this is heading. The final kid who has to face their insecurities and darkest memories is Chris. And that is Deltarune. Although it's obviously not. First, let's recap what we've gone over so far. Deltarune is, at its core, a story about teens with insecurities confronting those insecurities through fantasy worlds. It's about a town whose residents slowly drifted apart. It's about the Holiday family and their missing daughter. And at the center of it all is Chris. Chris's story so far is about control, specifically control over their future. Prior to our intrusion, the desire to stop marching forward and go back was already on their mind, and now that we're here, that desire is mixed with something else, fear that they'll never be in control again. Our story is about stopping an event that threatens to rip away reality, which is where the world really needs to be saved. Only through coming together, forming bonds, and facing down our insecurities do we stand a chance at saving the world. Characters will probably grapple with the fact that the Dark Worlds are fake, specifically Susie, but ultimately, Noelle isn't fake and that connection will help her come to terms with what's real and what's not. On the topic of Dark Worlds, there are fantasy kingdoms built to please. The characters inside are forced to play specific roles, with their entire identity based around serving lighteners. The idea of Deltarune being a story about breaking out of your defined role and becoming something better tells me that perhaps the Darkeners aren't doomed either. The idea of breaking out of a predetermined role will be demonstrated in many ways. Susie goes from being the mean, scary one to honestly one of the most loving members of the party, with this change symbolized by her shift from team damage dealer to possibly healer. The Darkners, well, maybe by banishing the Angel's Heaven and restoring balance, we can send them back to the darkness, no longer anchored to a world they must serve. The thing that will stay with the Lightners as they return to the Light World is their new lives, their new friends, and their memories. And as they say goodbye to the Darkeners, they will make sure they don't forget what's with them in the dark. There's a big loose end here. We, the players, still exist in the story. And even if the Lightners think of us as the Angel, that still doesn't explain how we got here. It's time to talk about him. The year is 2016. W.D. Gaster was the old royal scientist to the underground before Alphys. His brilliance was supposedly unmatched. Entry number 17, an old experiment log, indicates he was experimenting with darkness. However, Undertale doesn't really talk about darkness at all, so he didn't know what this could even be referring to. One day, he fell into his own creation and vanished without a trace. What this means, we don't know. The Gaster followers quickly leave us before we can ask more questions. Gaster himself appears to look like this, and appears if your fun value is 66. This is actually one of the only things we know about the guy, his association with the number 6. His in-game stats, which never actually show up anywhere in the game, are all 6s. This is purposeful and seems to tie in some kind of demonic symbolism. Certain sound effects are tied to Gaster. Gaster seems to be a skeleton and has some connection to Sans, who uses Gaster Blasters. Sans' secret machine, as well as the note you get that says don't forget after talking to Clam Girl, who wants to introduce you to Susie, seems to indicate that there's some connection to another world of sorts. And then the trail went cold. Deltarune features W.D. Gaster quite often. 
Do you remember how I said there's a middleman realistically connecting us to Deltarune without necessarily breaking suspension of disbelief? This is that middleman. Deltarune's true beginning is the survey program, which asks us to create a vessel. Let it be known, the character talking directly to us, yes, me and you, in this segment is WD Gaster. There's no doubt about it, especially because on Twitter, Gaster gave it away by saying we've been looking for him and that he's been looking for us as well. Gaster is the reason we're even in Deltarune, and that's done through the survey program. Let's go back to that discussion on suspension of disbelief. Revealing to the characters that they're part of a video game makes no sense, specifically because video games are written by someone. If Chris and Susie find out their characters and say, OMG, we're in a video game, this is horrible, they're not even saying that, that was written by a writer. This is obvious. This is also why we're called the Angel, to allow everything we do to have in-universe logic to explain it. So the Lighteners think of us as the Angel, no problem, but we know that we're not actually the ancient creature worshipped by Lighteners. We're a bunch of random idiots thinking about Deltarune years removed from the game's last release. So how actually are we in there? Gaster did it. The very beginning of Deltarune has us connect with Gaster. The survey program asks us if we accept everything that'll happen from now on. We click, I agree. This is the most important decision we make in Deltarune. He then asks if we're connected. The survey program is built differently from all of Deltarune, as it's made up of several files named differently from the rest. On your screen now is a list of files within Deltarune's code that are named differently. Most of them are used for the survey program, and all of them... Well, let's put a pin in that for now. I think it's safe to confirm a theory that's existed since Deltarune first came out. Gaster himself created the survey program, which is used to connect us to Deltarune. In that way, Gaster knows who we are. And while even Gaster might view our influence over the world as that of a holy figures, he also recognizes that to us, these worlds are a game. Gaster has us design a vessel to control, before the process is interrupted, though, by a second voice. One that sends us into Chris. I have a feeling I know who this is, however, despite their interference, they don't really affect too much. Gaster's program is still responsible for helping us select the chapters and our save file. Yes, the save menu and the three save files are all canon. Gaster himself appears here, speaking to us directly from the menu. Everything that's not part of the light or dark worlds, the save menu, the chapter select, the survey, hell, even possibly the game over screen, are all part of the survey program. Now, obviously the credits aren't canon, I think that's really the only exception. It cannot be understated how important this all is. Gaster's literally giving us access to Deltarune through this menu. But it goes deeper than that. All of these oddly named files have something in common. They all relate to making Deltarune function as a video game. The save menu, the game over screen, all of it relates to our control over Deltarune as if it was a video game. Despite my statement that the Lightners aren't going to realize they're part of a video game, they are. And the things we do in those game menus influence the real world. We can equip armor on our characters they actually wear. We control their actions in the battle menu. But this battle menu is a foreign concept to them. Noelle actually is surprised to find out that fighting in the dark world works just like Dragon Blazers, one of her favorite games. There's more to this though. Castle Town. Did you know that in Chapter 1, before anyone but Ralsei is there, a town named after your real name is full of RPG buildings? These buildings serve no purpose besides pleasing us, be besides acting as a generic town. These symbols are actually very similar to those of Dragon Quest, despite the fact that nobody is here to stock the shelves in the store. To run the inn, to carry weapons. This was built that way by default, as if it was designed with the intention that we'd play it like a video game. One of the topics you can bring up to Clover to argue about is games. Jevil flat out acknowledges that the world is a game, down to knowing that our characters have HP. If that's not enough, look at this Ralse line after we beat Queen in the boxing arcade game. But Chris is quite good at games, aren't they? It all points to one central truth. What's Gaster's deal? Gaster created our experience. He didn't literally create the light world or anything like that, no, he literally created our experience with Deltarune as a video game. With knowledge of how we interacted with Undertale, he connected us to the light world, giving us the ability to influence the world as if it was a game. An unnatural form of control over a natural world. Think of it like this, the light worlds are, to us, 
kind of the same way the Dark Worlds are to Chris and company. The Dark Worlds is implied to exist without the fountain being formed, but the fountain takes a world that's implied to exist and creates an instance of it almost that Lightners can experience. However, the people inside that instance can't go into other instances because they're basically under control. In that same way, Gaster's taking the Deltarune light world and bringing it into existence, specific scenarios for us to play out, that forces all the characters into specific roles. So, Gaster's given us control over the Deltarune world, the ability to play it like a video game. But why? Well, this one's easy. We know that the knight is leading the Deltarune world towards a dark path. We know it looks as if the Roaring will destroy the world. And we have an explicit answer as to why he's doing this from Gaster himself. He says he wants to create a new future. Gaster is a heroic good guy who sent us to the Deltarune world to stop it from being destroyed. With our help, we can guide the heroes to the end of the prophecy, where we'll banish the angels' heaven and restore balance to the world. The end. Right? Well, not exactly. There's actually a little bit more going on here. On the surface, this is what Gaster's doing. The entirety of Deltarune is rounded off when you think of it this way. Gaster called us to Deltarune to save the world. The Lightners are going to travel through the Dark Worlds to fulfill the prophecy. They save both worlds, leaving the Darkeners forever, and we save the Light World, leaving it forever, with Gaster serving the role of a hero. That is, until you look a tiny bit deeper. There's actually a secondary plot line that's hidden beneath everything. Gaster's told us that the future is in your hands, and similarly, Ralse has told us that our choices will help reach a good end. Theoretically, this makes sense, as I described earlier, which probably made you mad because you thought I was stupidly missing one of the game's biggest plot points, our choices seem to matter. We create our own robot, avoid breaking Birdly's arm, choose which Darkeners to recruit, a few, none, all, it's up to us. Not only that, but there's a ton of optional content, all of which alters the game in pretty big ways. This is, in my opinion, the intended mindset the casual player is supposed to have. However, this quickly falls apart if you play Deltarune for longer than a quick casual run and think about it for at least five minutes. One of Deltarune's biggest ongoing plot points is that our choices don't actually matter. Everything we choose in the Dark World is superficial, and does not affect the story at all. No matter what thrash machine you make, nothing changes. Whether Birdly's arm is broken or not, nothing changes. Many choices are made for us before we're even given the option. The choices in our role as the leader is entirely superficial. Everything that'll happen has already been set in stone. Rousey himself says this adventure is foretold exactly by the prophecy. Well, this could lead to a deeper discussion. Perhaps we can talk about the nature of whether our choices matter in any video game, or what it actually means to have our choices matter. But stop, because that's kind of stupid. Deltarune's choices not mattering is specifically in contrast to Undertale. In Undertale, our choices matter. The future was in our hands, and the fate of the world was decided by what we choose. In Deltarune, that's not the case. There's one story, and our choices are given the illusion of being able to control the future. But they're not. Deltarune's choices, and whether or not they matter, revolve around one specific concept. And that's the concept of fate. Fate is another one of Deltarune's repeating ideas. Many characters, specifically those confirmed to have some sort of extraordinary knowledge, have told us outright that fate is approaching, and there's a future we cannot stop from coming. Toby Fox has spoken about how Deltarune has only one ending numerous times. Susie, in the beginning of the game, says your choices don't matter, in a scene that is seemingly meant to entirely destroy previously established conventions. This is not Undertale, and even though we can make deep, complex choices, fate is working against us. The fact that Ralse says the journey is foretold exactly by the prophecy indicates that, yes, there is some sort of predetermined path that we're on. The light world barely gives you any choices, but even then it reinforces the fact that you can't change fate. When Noelle asks you if you want to partner up with her, your options are yes or not yet. Not no, it's not yet, because this isn't a decision you can make. It's a fact that you'll eventually be forced to say yes. The ultimate sign of this impending fate is found in the hospital. When examining this bead toy, it says the beads march grimly along their set path. This is, let it be known, broken in the weird route, when fate is actually defied, but let's not go there yet. This proves, though, that the bead toy represents fate in a way, and there is a set path ahead of us that we're marching along, grimly. Because whatever lies ahead is bad, actually. This isn't all of it, though. There are so many instances of Deltarune reinforcing its set story on us, reminding us that the adventure ahead is written in fate. So now another question needs to be asked. Who knows about this fate? 
Chris is a weird gray area, as they themselves have complex fate stuff going on. Susie is an absolute no, she doesn't have a clue. Queen and King? Nope, they're dead set on winning themselves. The only two characters who explicitly confirm to know about fate and a set in stone future are Jevil and Spamton. Oh yeah, and maybe Sean, but that's not the point. Both of them are worth talking about, but honestly, only briefly. Both met Gaster, both learned dark truths about the world, about HP, about the makeup of Deltarune's world, about strings and heaven, and about fate. Both Jevil and Spamton know that things are being puppeteered from behind the scenes, with Jevil asking if we can stop fate, and Spamton hoping that we can break our own strings someday. Jevil also says Hell's Roar bubbles from the depths, which is worth mentioning because it seems that the depths is the location Gaster is currently located in. So this leads us back to Gaster. Both superbosses learned about fate from Gaster. This means Gaster has to know that there is a set path in front of us we cannot deviate from. And yet, he has chosen not to tell us. Why specifically avoid telling us? Why make it seem like we have choices? Why imply that the future is in our hands when you're willing to go tell Jevil and Spamton the truth? Isn't the prophecy supposed to be the thing that breaks fate? Why is it implied that fate is still approaching despite the fact that we're following this prophecy to a T? Well, it's for a pretty simple reason. Gaster wants us to think that we have meaningful choices and the ability to change the future. There's one other character who knows about fate, who has some amount of future knowledge in his head, and who's telling us that our choices matter. I am talking about Ralsei. Ralsei knows information that we do not, and his information is without a doubt suspicious and deserving of some questioning. Let's go over this. Ralsei just recently started existing, alone and isolated, in a town designed for us, the player. Ralsei knows this legendary prophecy which was passed through space and time that dictates the future. Ralsei treats Chris with baby gloves, doing whatever they want and allowing them to do pretty stupid things, even if that means hitting him over and over. Ralsei doesn't astral project in these scenes. Ralsei knows what Susie is doing without actually seeing it. This is proven because if you skip the Susie and Noelle scene in Chapter 2, Ralsei still remarks that Susie's thinking of her ride with Noelle when you go to the Ferris wheel sign. He knows it happened even without seeing it. As a matter of fact, on the weird route where things don't play out as normal, Ralsei freaks out, even saying we were supposed to before stopping himself. As stated by Twitter user N underscore H-A-A-R, According to the Japanese translation, Ralsei actually says something along the lines of, if it was true, then here, dot dot dot. The implication seems relatively clear. Ralsei knows about the future, about where we will generally end up. This is furthered by the way he totally dismisses the secret bosses, even though Chris is somewhat startled by the whole thing. There's only one logical explanation. Ralsei was given information too. And judging by the fact that this magical prophecy he's reading was written in Wingdings on the Deltarune site in 2016, I think I know who he got his information from. Let me say one thing. Ralsei is not by any means evil. I also don't think that Ralsei would be purposefully leading us towards our doom. It's worth noting that, while it seems like Ralsei has a loose idea of how the game itself works, our existence, and how the story will play out, he still believes the prophecy is something good. He wants Susie to act like a hero, he wants to make sure the Dark Worlds are in as nice as possible for our heroes, he wants everyone to have a good time. But it's clear to me that Ralsei is a guiding hand put in place by Gaster to reinforce the idea that we're making meaningful choices, while quickly and decisively walking us down the set path. So now we have a pretty good idea of what Gaster's deal is. He dropped us in the Deltarune world with the promise of being able to save the world. He's telling us that we have meaningful choices, convincing us that, like Undertale, it's up to us and our decisions to guarantee a good outcome. However, deep down, Gaster has something he's not telling us. The path forward was determined long before we showed up. He, and by extension Shom, know what Dark Worlds will open next, and who will be there. Ralsei knows that it's important to try and make sure everyone's having fun, while dismissing the seriously concerning aspects of the secret boss's characters. Still, though, this doesn't necessarily mean anything bad. Unless, of course, I had objective evidence that what Gaster is leading this to is bad, or that the prophecy is flawed in some way, and... I don't. I, at least not much. There's no smoking gun just yet, and this seems on purpose. I don't actually think this twist, that our fate was decided for us long before we started playing, is something meant to be revealed until way later on, and because of that, evidence as far as what's actually going on is very slim. But I can go through what I do have. Jevil and Spamton both see a dark future ahead. 
Yes, they know that they're fake, but they also seem to think the light world is fake in some way, that there's something on the outside that actually has power, and they both know something dark is coming. Jevil says that Hell's roar bubbles from the depths. The language there is very interesting. If the depths are the deepest layers of darkness, and the roaring involves the world being subsumed by darkness, could this be what Jevil is referring to? That the roaring is Hell's roar which is bubbling from the depths? Who do we know that has some kind of hell-like symbolism? Who is very much associated with the devil? It's Gaster. I think the prophecy implying the roaring is a sort of holy event caused by the angel is a misdirection. If we assume that Jevil is talking about the roaring when he says hell's roar bubbles from the depths, could the angel's heaven, the place on the edge of reality, be where W.D. Gaster is currently located? A place where he looks down on everyone in the light world, where he's stuck after falling too deep into darkness. And perhaps if this is all true, and if Gaster is able to manipulate the dark worlds in meaningful ways, and if Gaster himself has been the one shaping the story ahead without us realizing, is it possible that Gaster sees himself as something of a fate-wielding, all-powerful angel? Hence the prophecy's wording? And what about the fact that Gaster is associated with the devil? When we accept the survey program and everything that'll happen, we're literally accepting Gaster's fate. He has stolen our ability to be the angel. He has written the story himself. We are literally selling our soul to the devil. The demonic presence I mentioned Chris was in contact with? I mean, come on, who else would it be? See, I, I don't think the Roaring and the Titans are the harbingers of doom that the game is making them out to be. I don't actually think that the fate Deltarune has been talking about is the Roaring destroying the world. So far, we've been under the impression that the prophecy is an attempt to fight against this fated apocalypse. But that just doesn't make any sense. Do you know what I think? I think that the fate that we're doomed to follow, that we cannot escape from, that we can't stop no matter what, is Gaster's plan. The prophecy. The legend of Delta Rune, A plan to get certain people at a certain place at a certain time. I don't know why. I really don't. In the past, I've suggested Gaster's plan is to be unbanished from the depths and take control over a save file. Could be cool, could be uncool, it depends on how it's done. But maybe it's something else, I don't know. But here's one thing I will say. Gaster's plan will leave us upset and opposing Gaster. Haven't you ever wondered why the weird route exists? The weird route is literally us working against Gaster's plan, as evidenced by upset Ralsei. Why else would we be actively fighting against that plot, unless it leads to something we don't like? It seems clear based on the dialogue that the weird route isn't a genocide-like boredom run based on our desire to see everything. It seems based on our desire to see one specific thing. Freedom. And while I'm sure Spamton's warning about all of this ending up bad is sure to come true, the bead toy indicates that, at the very least, our plan is working. All this is to say, Gaster is not the peachy keen hero everyone thinks he is. To recap what we've gone over so far. Gaster is the one who brought us to the light world using the survey program, which allows us to interact with Deltarune as if it were a video game. Gaster is implying we are the angel by telling us that our choices matter, an idea being reinforced by Ralsei, while both are actually guiding us down a set path, removing our power as the angel, uh, down a set path that's written in fate by Gaster himself. Gaster has outlined the future for us, written the story, written the prophecy given us the ability to control Deltarune like a game. Do you know what this means? That Gaster is actually taking the role of a game developer. And while the light world itself isn't a game, and I believe it's an actually existent realm, our control over it and our experiences within it are. That's the game. Technically speaking, when you play any game, you're signing over your rights to the developer and accepting everything that'll happen, because they themselves are the only one who knows what'll happen. By clicking this, we've put ourselves in the same spot as Chris. We made a deal with the devil and now we're being controlled, manipulated. Our every move is being controlled by someone else. The things we can say are limited, the places we can go restricted. The idea of fate being locked in? No, that's not fate. This is a video game with a story we can't work against. Because it's a video game, because it works that way, because there's a story for the video game, it's fate. What'll happen at World's Edge, where reality and dream meet? We don't know, but we can say for certain that Gaster's plan will not be something we accept. Deltarune's already laid out the groundwork for us to be mad at fate and refuse to accept the ending. The one ending. But we've already signed our soul over, so what can we do? 
Now, before we move forward, I need to address something. A while ago, I made a video very, very closely aligned with this one, called Angel's Heaven. The point of that video was similar to this one, Gaster's manipulating us. It was kind of a bad video looking back, disorganized and full of holes. But what's important is, there are many theories that dispute this argument. Many, except most of it, including the idea that Gaster has some kind of manipulation going on, but argue that Gaster has good intentions. One specifically that I feel like it would be worth mentioning is Gaster Fanboy Theory, which has a Google Doc and a great video made by Weasel Weasel W. Let me first say, I recommend you watch it. It's a great video and offers an alternate perspective to Gaster, one that I personally, despite disagreeing with, enjoy. I am not at all trying to tear down the videos or any idea that it presents, I just think it's necessary to discuss because it's the theory that gets brought up the most when I'm talking with people about my gaster thoughts. This theory suggests a lot of things, but one specific thing it argues, and the idea at the core of it that I want to discuss, is that Gaster truly is trying to bring about a better future. He wants the best for Lighteners, and everything I said about his manipulation of the plot, about the prophecy being written by him, is true. However, it'll all lead to a good ending, as he's fighting against a different fate. The theory suggests that without Gaster's influence, the world is going to end and the Lighteners are going to die. To break this down into a more manageable sentence, Gaster is actually manipulating the plot for good reasons and is himself trying to fight against a bad future. I completely disagree with this, and it's for an admittedly flimsy line of reasoning. My thoughts on storytelling and my personal interpretation of Deltarune. Many of these theories argue that the fate Gaster's fighting against is being brought about by another being, maybe the angel, maybe the knight, etc. This I take issue with because I think that removes all agency from the player. I think that the player is the angel, and is supposed to be the angel in every game we play. We are literally the ones bringing about the future. Our limitations in Deltarune are an unnatural form of control placed over a natural world by Gaster. When we signed away our rights, accepted everything Gaster had planned, that's the moment we really stopped being the angel. That's the moment we stopped being able to decide fate. We still have the power, but now it's wielded by Gaster. I also think this is an example of something I call a boomerang twist, when a twist wildly subverts your expectations of what's going on, you know, like a good twist does, before coming right back around and not actually affecting anything or changing the outlook or outcome of your characters or their motivations. If Deltarune is purposefully hiding the fact that Gaster is limiting our control, the fact that he's lying to us and pretending like our choices matter, and the fact that Gaster himself wrote the prophecy, the reveal will not cast Gaster in a positive light. Should the reveal be, Gaster's been puppeteering everything, but don't worry, it was for a good reason, you would have went along with anyway, that doesn't really change anything. It's doing the twist just to do a twist, without wildly swinging the story or our understanding of it in any direction. I also think, based on Chris's character, that control over another person, knowingly or unknowingly, and the forcing of them into a specific role in life, is bad, and I don't see Gaster getting off the hook for doing it himself to us. I really think this situation can be explained simply. We've been inserted into Chris. We're unknowingly following Gaster's exact plan that he created. When we clicked accept, we were signing our rights away to Gaster, who acts as the game developer and will lead us to a bad ending. We'll ultimately realize at the very end of the game that we've been tricked and are in an identical situation to Chris, who has no control over their own life and is forced into following a specific role themselves, probably after making a deal with the devil. Following this, we'll be hopeless. But we're not. You see, Deltarune will not actually have a bad ending. I actually think that Deltarune is a subversion of the Earthbound Halloween hack. Please stick with me. I don't think this will ever be brought up in an official capacity, nor will it be something that necessarily is meant to be recognized by most players. But the Halloween hack and Deltarune have many similarities. Both released on or around Halloween, both include the phrase Roaring, with the Halloween hack even calling it the Roaring Dark, both are set in melancholic fall towns meant to induce some amount of nostalgia in the player, both feature a scientist as an important character who holds major relevancy towards the end of the game, both feature a main character who is taller, older, and more edgy than the first game's main character, who has hair covering their eyes. The final boss, and Donuts, appears in the overworld as an edited sprite of Yuboa, the supposed inspiration for Mystery Man, aka Gaster's design. The theme that plays in the beginning of every area is synchronicity, a word that Clam Girl mentions in Undertale before giving you the one singular tease for Deltarune. All of these are very much coincidences. 
or they're all purposeful teases in the Master Toby Fox's grand chess game. That's really up to the individual to decide. I know there are people so incredibly prudish and without frivolity that they've already clicked off my video just because I brought up the Halloween hack. And after the friend inside me debacle of June 2024, I know there are people who will all take all of this as absolute fact. I personally think that, in a strange, strange way, the Earthbound Halloween hack is kinda like Toby Fox's magic hand. A world made from his dreams. Dreams that may heavily influence his creativity. The similarities between the Earthbound Halloween hack falls into one of two categories. Completely speculative or eerily similar from an aesthetics point of view, but nothing else. This monster with tons of eyes? Speculative disregard. This Uboa sprite? Well, uh, a better YouTuber would have dug his heels in here and made sure you know this is absolute proof that Gaster is the ultra spooky final boss, but Yuboa was just a popular character beloved by Yume Niki freaks, of which Toby Fox was apparently a big one. Disregard. The Roaring Dark? Well, yeah, it's clear that the wording returns in Deltarune, but in the Earthbound Halloween hack, it's describing a sewer system, whereas in Deltarune, the Roaring is an apocalyptic event. Basically, the Halloween hack is a look at things Toby Fox finds cool or interesting. He has Varric heavily implied to be dead outside the player's control. He has the sprites regress to an 8-bit style before the final boss to show you that you're limited in your abilities. He has wording and ideas that he likes. Characters and concepts he thinks are cool. There's literally enemies called amalgamates. It's not some kind of 4D chess. Repeating elements, wording, or ideas across a creator's body of work is normal. But what's worth speaking about with the Halloween hack is the story. In the making of, Toby himself talks about his decision-making process when writing the story. He says the main theme of the game is the lack of choice. There really is no choice in this game. From the moment you start to the moment you finish, you're destined to kill Dr. And Donuts. There are only two endings, but they both eventually end up the same way. It's all a big joke on the player. That's why Tucson is a little claustrophobic, because no matter what you do, no matter who you talk to, you can only delay the inevitable. Once you get to the end of the sewers, you can't go back, you can only go forward. No choices. Once you get to the end of winters, you can't go back, you can only go forward. No choice. You know why there isn't a choice there? Because you already chose to make Varric go into the door. You already chose to go forward. The game tells you you have a choice, that you always have a choice, then all you can do is kill him. This is how the Earthbound Halloween hack ends. Without giving you another choice, you cannot fight fate. And I think that Deltarune is taking that concept, legitimizing it by wrapping it in this big multi-layered meta setup, and then expanding on it tenfold, telling a story that's surprisingly hopeful. See, I'm not gonna lie to you. We're close to the end of this video. Past the initial Gaster is actually in control and an antagonist reveal, what will happen next is largely in the dark. I think there are several things that may happen. The Eggman could play a much larger role than we think, the Depths could be a much larger area than we expect, and maybe Gaster's not the only one down there. Maybe all the people he's with are other fragments of himself. He is shattered, isn't he? Maybe we'll fight him. Maybe we'll have to find some roundabout other way to fight him. Maybe this guy will have some relevance. Maybe Alvin will have some relevance. Maybe we'll have to play Dragon Blazers. Maybe we'll have to replay the regular story in a weird alternate second version with the events out of order. Maybe we'll be forced to play the weird route which has already proven to be a surefire way to break Gaster's control over the narrative. I can't really tell you what Gaster's going to do when we reach the ending. I can't tell you why it's going to upset us or how. And I can't tell you how we're going to move forward. That's not this kind of video. The actual endgame of Deltarune can go in any direction possible. I'd be excited for all of them. What I can tell you, though is that Deltarune has already given us solid ideas of how we can stop Gaster and rewrite fate. The robot spammed and corrupts was the embodiment of Metaton's dream. They filled it with their own hope, which gave it an incredible power. Hope. Hope to change the future. Through that, the robot became incredibly powerful. We, too, have created something, something we poured our hopes and dreams into. That's the true way forward. Through our hopes and dreams, maybe we can make something that's powerful enough to change the future. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's December holiday. December is also in the depths or wherever Gaster is. She was most likely the one to interrupt the intro sequence to send us into Chris. She has already shown that she can go against Gaster's control. 
Every character has important memories of Des. Elements of Des litter the dark worlds. The game's teasing a big plotline with Des as we're supposed to find her. Noelle is tied to breaking games, isn't she? She's associated with glitches, video game secrets. Maybe Noelle has the power. Maybe it's the connection between Noelle and Des. Maybe it's Susie who, by the way, is the only character in the game thus far able to override the player's control, down to refusing to wear certain pieces of clothing. There are so many ways it can go down. But again, this video isn't trying to figure out exactly how it'll happen, how our characters will break fate and rewrite the game itself. This video is trying to figure out why it matters. We know that the Darkeners are created specifically to serve the Lighteners. That's their entire purpose. However, this actually might not be true. Toby Fox himself confirmed that they're corrupted by the fountain's creation, and we know that if you take a Darkener from one fountain to another, they're no longer meant to exist in that world. A role hasn't been created for them, so they turn to stone, because their entire purpose is to appeal to us. And I think the Lighteners will eventually realize that, to their world, the Darkeners are fake. They don't exist. Their idea is made up of real-world experiences, memories, hopes, and dreams. And getting lost in that fantasy would be bad. So what, do we get rid of all the Dark Worlds? No. I do think at the end of Deltarune we're going to banish them forever. Not in a bad way, but in a nice emotional way, where we say goodbye to the Darkeners permanently. That definitely feels like Ralsei's long-term story arc after all, finding out who he is to serve himself. But as long as the Dark Worlds are part of the Light World, as long as they're catering towards these specific people, then they have no freedom, and are permanently doomed to fill one role for eternity. So we must separate, with the knowledge that we need to remember them. The Lighteners will never forget who they are. They're with them in the dark. But this exact thing will also happen to our connection with the Light World. They cater towards us. They make us happy. They fulfill roles determined by the game developer in order to make us, the player, happy. There's nothing wrong with us playing Deltarune. This is, after all, an escape. A fantasy. But it's a fantasy we can't cling to forever. These characters will forever be locked into one role as long as we're around, and we need to break those roles. This is what every character's larger story is really about, the desire to break the role assigned to them by life. Susie isn't going to be standoffish and mean, she's learned to have empathy and compassion for her friends, and this is why she's slowly becoming a healer as well. Chris, well, Chris is who the entire story centers around. Whatever happened to them, they'll need to accept, and through their connection with us, they can break the chains of fate holding them down on one path. We'll have to say goodbye to the light world, to separate ourselves and grant them the freedom they desire. It's the only way, allowing them to stay in our hearts as memories. As long as we don't forget, it's like they're still there, still alive in their own world, no longer bound to seven chapters of a faded narrative. That's what this is. The ability to play Deltarune, its existence as a video game, and the story that's been written for us are all unnatural forms of control over a natural world. Fate is not written in stone, it's being enforced by us, written by the developer. We're not going to just have to duck out of the intended ending, we're going to need to make it so that this story doesn't even exist. As long as we're playing the game designed for us, we can't stop fate. These characters will be stuck playing these roles in seven chapters just like the Darkeners are as long as their fountains are open. Because it's a video game, and no matter your feelings for these characters, they're playing roles in a story they were written for. If Undertale took the idea of saving, loading, and resetting and made them diegetic functions, Deltarune is doing that for the entire idea of being a video game. The only way to win, the only way to free them, is to stop it from being a video game at all, and say goodbye forever. That's why we can't own Lightener plushies, that's why Sans has a picture that says don't forget, that's why the song says they're with us in the dark. Because Deltarune's true ending will have us breaking the game, ripping the idea of the narrative apart, and going all the way back to the source. Maybe Gaster will be the final boss. Maybe you won't actually fight him face to face. Maybe he'll possess the body of Des or something. Regardless, the true final fight will be against Deltarune itself. And that was Deltarune, Devil's Heaven. That's it, folks. Go home. No, I'm kidding. Uh, stay a little bit. I have a couple things to talk about. Let's recap everything I've said. Uh, let's, let's go over Devil's Heaven in a nutshell. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I gotta. I do these stupid videos now. I I found that the best possible audio quality is if I'm I'm under a comforter. I'm so hot. It's so hot. 
So I'm gonna, I don't care if the audio is buzzing for the end here. It's gonna, I gotta take the comforter off. Let's recap what I've said so far. Deltarune is a story about a real world taken over by an outside force from an area known as the Depths. That person is W.D. Gaster, who was once a character in Undertale, but after experimenting with darkness, he fell into the Depths, realizing that Undertale was, well, a fictional construct created for the enjoyment of an outside entity. Realizing this, he began to plot a way to... something. Again, I'm not going to pretend I know what he wants from all this, just how he's going to do it. He contacted Chris and told them deep lore, making them the Knight. I mean, uh, sorry, giving them a role to play in the story. He contacted Ralse, telling him the story of the prophecy about the angel creating Castletown for us, etc. He then contacted us. With all the pieces in place, Gaster created a program that allows us to control Deltarune like a video game. This is unnatural, not meant to be. Our control, while we may be referred to as the angel during in-universe observation, is literally that of a being outside of reality playing the world like a game. We'll slowly make our way towards the ending, all the while thinking our choices are really important, only to find out that actually none of our choices matter, and everything we could possibly think of was already accounted for by Gaster. Gaster made this world like a linear video game, making it so that there's really only one path forward. The reason the game's first big line is you can't choose who you are in this world is because that's someone warning us about what Gaster's done. He's literally written fate and decided that there are seven concrete chapters where these characters are bound to specific roles. You can't choose who you are in a world where every step you take is predetermined by the world itself. This is Chris's deepest internal struggle, being unable to choose who they are in the world, and while this problem was existent prior to Gaster's appearance, this is a narrative way to take that struggle and turn it into a big literal plot point. The same goes for us, though. We can't choose who we are, either. He's been pulling our strings the entire time, all to get us to World's Edge, where we banish the Angel's Heaven. As I've already said, I don't know what specifically will happen here, I just know it's not as simple as saving the world, and it'll most likely benefit Gaster on some personal level. We will then need to find a way to beat fate, to undo whatever it is we did, and to free the Lighteners for good. With our newfound knowledge that literally everything is being controlled, we'll determine that the true conflict of Deltarune is that it's a video game at all. In the same way that the Darkeners are meant to cater towards the Light World and the Lighteners, unable to fulfill any roles but the ones assigned to them, the Lighteners are stuck as well. Through some sort of post-game but not really post-game exploration, and probably through December Holiday in some way, we will find a way to do it to break Gaster's story. Gaster will end up as the main antagonist, and even if he's a bubbly sweetheart full of love and compassion, we'll still end up opposing him. Deltarune will end with us destroying it. Deltarune itself, that is. The Dark Worlds will be banished, allowing the Darkeners to live on as memories in the minds of the Lighteners, and potentially off on their own plane of existence somewhere. Even if, to the Lighteners, the Dark Worlds were fake, that doesn't actually mean they were fake at all. The Lightners' adventures through the Dark Worlds gave them the strength to save their world and move forward in life, finding out who they truly are. It allowed them to confront their deepest insecurities and win, and in that same way, we'll have to banish the Light World. It's the only way to truly set them free, otherwise they'll be stuck in an endless loop of going through the motions in seven chapters of a pre-written narrative. The final battle, so to speak, regardless of if we actually physically fight Gaster, will be to beat Deltarune itself, to stop it from being a game, in doing so freeing everyone inside. My theory also suggests that everything happening inside the Light World, our intrusion, the Dark World's existence, the Roaring, aren't intended to happen, and wouldn't naturally occur. They're all due to W.D. Gaster. By breaking Deltarune and beating Gaster, we'll be guaranteeing the freedom and safety of the Light World and the Lighteners forever. Or alternatively, something that just popped into my head right now, if it's true that the Lightners and the Light World are doomed, or the Light World itself, I mean, maybe there's a way we can save the Lightners by sending them to other worlds or some stupid thing like that. I mean, we still have to explain how Sans got to Undertale, right? Although that's just a random thing. Oh my goodness, that's that. That is Deltarune Devil's Heaven. It's finished. Uh, the rest of this is unscripted. It's just me talking a little bit. Um... That's it. If you don't like me, you can click off. But if you like me, you can keep listening. Uh, I am really sorry this took so long. <laughs> I It's been like four or five months since my last video, and I, it wasn't intended to be that way. Uh, just to give you a quick explanation, because I do kind of feel like I owe you something. When I finished the last video, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this next video that's going to basically be my giant thoughts on Deltarune as a whole. And unfortunately, that didn't really come out. Uh, I made, I think it was like 60 pages or something or a hundred page. I don't remember, but it was like 
I think the video that I ended up recording was like three and a half hours long and it just sounded bad. And so I'm like, all right, you know what? I've put a ton of effort into this, but it's too, it's too stuffed. You know, it was a, it was too much of a stuffed video. I talked about this, everything I said here, I talked about, you know, oh, Deltarune and its video game influence and oh, Gaster and, and what specifically he's going to do. It was so overstuffed that the core theory at the heart of it, which was this video, it didn't come out right. It didn't feel natural. And so I said, all right, I'm going to redo this. Now, this was about a month in, right? I didn't work hard on it every day. Believe it or not, I'm not doing YouTube with like, it's, this isn't a, like a full-time thing. I've, well, of course not, but it's also not really even a part-time thing. My, I'm a, a game developer. And despite the fact that I haven't, you know, published anything yet, I've been working really hard for a really long time. And that is my main focus in life. And this channel taking off was kind of accidental. So it took about a month to get that one three hour video done, uh, recorded it. I didn't edit it, but I listened to it and I said, this is bad. So then Life kind of got in the way. Uh, the two months after that were kind of just busy life stuff that stopped me from working on it whatsoever. And then everything cleared up, and now I've I've got got my my button gear. And here's the video. It's out. You're listening to it. You're watching it. So that's an explanation as for why it took so long. The video itself did not take four months to make. Don't think that. Uh, and my next few videos will not take four months to make as well. Uh, and that's that. On the topic of my next videos, um. I don't know how to say this because I end up, I always say things about what I'm going to do on YouTube and it always comes back to bite me in the ass. Uh, last year I said, oh, I'm going to make this retrospective on the Halloween franchise. And then I didn't because I just didn't have the time. So what I'm saying here, you know, maybe I'll just immediately fly against it next video. Take it with a grain of salt. I am super burned out of Undertale and Deltarune. Like <laughs> crazy, crazy uninterested in thinking about it. The only thing I like thinking about now is like, what could happen in chapters three and four, like the actual plot, the experience. Like I was talking with um, people on Discord recently and it's like, I like thinking about the fun stuff. Oh, what's Tenna going to be like? Oh, this and that. The lore, like, you know, I'm, I'm done. You know, this is my thought. I think that the whole thing with Gaster is, you know, oh, he's spooky guy from outside this world, tricking us, whatever, whatever, whatever. Final antagonist. I don't want to talk about it anymore. So, I mean, I think that chapters three and four are imminent. I think that they're this fall for sure. Although it'd be entirely fair when the Spanton sweepstakes were done, I said, oh, easily next fall, we're getting the rest of the game. And then that didn't happen. So that didn't happen at all. So, so I don't know. I'm, I'm always wrong about this stuff, but I really do feel like this fall or early spring, maybe, um, chapters three and four, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Three and four. So, you know, I'm probably not going to do too many Deltarune lore videos from now until then. Maybe if I think of something fun, maybe some kind of cool thing, maybe I'll do it. Um, I've debated making another Woody theory related video, like a kind of what the hell was all that, but I think I might be a little too late. It's now been like a month since all the Woody theory stuff happened, so it might be a little too late. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's really all I have to say. I have videos on other things I'd like to make, you know, shorter, punchier, better videos. Um, maybe a Delta Room video or two, but I am back and I am going to be uploading regularly and I'm already thinking about what my next video might be. I'm not going to tell you because again... You know, I can't predict anything on this channel. I want to thank you for watching. If you clicked on the video, that means that um, either YouTube's algorithm hasn't killed my channel yet, or you cared enough to watch the uh, this video. So thank you very much. Sorry it took so long. I hope you enjoyed. To be entirely honest, I did not have a good time making this one, <laughs> but I'm glad it's done, and I'm glad you guys get to see it. So thank you. And uh, if any of this happens, you have to come back to this video and comment, Spooky Dude, you are the smartest person on the face of the earth. You are always right, and you have never been wrong in your entire life. 